Uh, Commissioner Cowan? Present. Commissioner Kipitanya? Uh, here. Commissioner Gowen? Here. Commissioner Tetro? Present. Commissioner Neese? I'm here. Mayor Mendez? Present. And we got notification for the record that Commissioner Mungia will not be at this meeting. So Thank you. Oh. Let's call the meeting to order. Today is May the 12th, 2020. Time is 5.04 p.m. I'll go ahead and read the call, Mayor. Notice of a special meeting of the City Commission of the City of Brownsville teleconference open meeting pursuant to Chapter 551, Title 5, Section 551.041 of the Texas Government Code, the Texas Opens Act. Notice is hereby given that the City Commission of the City of Brownsville will conduct a special meeting on Tuesday, May 12, 420 at 5 p.m via WebEx teleconference meeting by logging on. Our meeting number is 969-728-362. This notice and meeting agenda were posted online at the City of Brownsville website. Any member wishing uh, to participate uh, in the meeting hosted through WebEx, they can also join with the following numbers that we have posted on our website. Um, we can go ahead and begin with the uh, invocation. We've had issues with Pastor Gutierrez who's unable to sign on. So, uh, Commissioner Tetra, will you give the invocation? I will. Okay. Dear Lord, we pray to you today. We ask you for your wisdom, for your guidance, and for your protection for every citizen that resides in the city of Brownsville. We ask that you protect us from COVID-19. We ask that you spare us from any um, severely sick people. We ask that you pray for us always and remember that we are good people who love you, Lord. Um, amen. Next on the agenda, we have the, the public comment period. We did not have anyone sign up for public comment, so we'll go on to the first uh, agenda items for items for individual consideration. Item number one, discussion regarding the City of Brownsville response to the urgent Public necessity concerning COVID-19, otherwise known as coronavirus, included but not limited to continuity staffing facilities and services, including actions and continuity of such operations, financial update, emergency procurement, and drive-through collections testing site update. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commission members. As part of item A, uh, for the organization, our update, centers around our continued efforts to plan for the recovery. The BTX Recovers Committee now has four subcommittees, and those are, uh, they fall under safety, communications, operations, facilities, and finance. They're having their first subcommittee meetings beginning this week. Uh, we won't have uh, hard recommendations for next Tuesday, but we are uh, planning for having more to share with the commission for the June, uh, the first meeting of June. So that is a, a, uh, a committee composed of directors from multiple departments that are working with the Office of Emergency Management, Public Health, Public Safety staff on, on basically making recommendations for how we work back into uh, the operating of our, of our facilities overall and, and some of the essential operations. Also, we have developed a tracking tool for our financial um, impacts. It won't be available today as part of Lupus Financial Update, but we do intend to, to introduce that to you all at next Tuesday's uh, regular meeting. So with that, we'll track uh, revenues and expenditures and be able to reconcile uh, some of our more significant costs and also where our revenues are they, uh, on things like sales tax. And also as we get more reimbursement funding, we'll be able to determine what is being offset on the cost side by some of that funding coming in from the outside. So overall, it'll spare you all having to go through the outlook that we provided back in March 16th. It has a lot of heavy narrative, and you'll be able to look at one high-level uh, spreadsheet that will give you all the information that you need. That's about all I have for item A. We'll be happy to answer any questions. I have a, I have a couple of questions. The um, do you have like a percentage of the people who are, aren't actually working right now or is everybody still working? Uh, can you go into that a little bit? 
Yes, sir. Everyone is still working. We, we've been able to repurpose uh, our continuity plans basically allow for the repurposing of most of our staff. 12% of our staff has been the constant number of those that have been doing telework. But um, within that percentage, and we can send you that pie chart, some of those are being rotated and some of those are what we call hybrid. In other words, they may be in one week, out one week uh, teleworking just to rotate staff around. Um, that's really happening for a lot of our internal service departments like finance, HR, IT, um, things like that. But for the most part, all of our staff continues to support some type of essential operation, whether it's emergency management or they have uh, backfilled special projects in other areas. We don't have any staff that's uh, at this point displaced. That's great, that's good news. Um, have there been any grievances or any of that kind of stuff filed during this process, uh, you know, revolving around COVID or their working conditions or anything? We, not necessarily from, uh, we have some, I think some, some feedback from our public safety, one of our public safety departments. The fire department had relayed some uh, communication to us through the chief that we've been working through. And overall, it's, it's being addressed, it's being handled within the stated uh, grievance processes that we have. Uh, as you all know, we have collective bargaining and, and those types of uh, agreements have to be followed uh, in cases like that. But outside of public safety, for the most right. part, we okay. haven't heard anything else. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Bernal, you stated that uh, Lupe will have some uh, or the uh, financial projections as far as sales tax revenue and other items next week, or did you say the first week of June? Uh, so yeah, the, the recovery committee will have their initial set of recommendations the first week of June. The tracking model will have an update next Tuesday. Okay. Yes. We know, that's for example, that, go ahead. Is that something that wasn't available yet? Because that's kind of the purpose of having these meetings is to get those kinds of updates. So Luke is gonna provide an update right now on all of our costs to date. What that model does is it gives you a better forecasting versus just a real-time uh, up-to-date expenditure item. Um, the revenue side, we've been tracking, but we hadn't put anything together outside of the financial outlook for y'all to, to really follow on a month-to-month -month basis. We just received the numbers for March last week. We know those are down 9%. Luca will likely speak to that on item B. But in terms of connecting everything, that reimbursement money that comes in, for example, last night, we received notice from the Texas Division of Emergency Management of additional reimbursement for the state. So as those figures come in, we want to be able to reconcile it better versus just describing here's our cost, here's our revenue, really tying it together and give you a better uh, tracking system on a month-to-month -month basis that could even be shared weekly, but really a lot of the more substantive changes should happen on a month-to-month -month basis. Any other questions? Okay. Next uh, part of uh, item one is the financial update emergency procurement. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Mayor. I would like to start by thanking you and for your continued support through this difficult time. The city of Brownsville, just like it has in the past, The city of Brownsville, just has, like it has in the past incidents, has once again established itself in being proactive and one of the first to act towards any incident. We will be outlining some of the ways we are trying to provide the best care towards our citizens and recuperate as many of our expenditures during this fluid situation. Although our current circumstances are far different than any other incident in our past, we continue to pursue every angle possible to find reimbursement opportunities for our city. We established new practices with our immigrant influx, which we've implemented towards this pandemic. On the next slide, you will see our current reimbursement process that we are currently using to strategize as a whole community to obtain as much assistance as we can be provided through federal and state grants and programs. The reimbursement team has been working hard to ensure we apply for reimbursements through programs and grants available. The reimbursement team has created an accounting system that has assisted in tracking our total amount of $5.5 billion expensed as of May 1st. 
$5.2 million is attributed to personnel costs, of which $1.74 million is not part of the operating cost. Total expenses of $2.03 million are not part of the operating costs. We are working with city departments to gather all backup information for reimbursement requests based on funding source. In December of 2019, legislation signed into law an appropriation of $17.863 billion in the fiscal year 2020 to fund the FEMA Disaster Relief Fund. Any questions? The total expenses that are not part of the operating budget at 2.03 million, is there a breakdown for those expenses? Typically we get breakdowns for these expenses. I just don't see anything on here. Yes, sir. So the $1.4 million is for the uh, overtime that is not op that is not on the operating cost and $300,000 is for the supplies and equipment leases and contracts. Okay, is there more of an itemization or line or better breakdown than, than just those numbers? We can go ahead and get you a breakdown of that. Okay, the reason I'm asking is because at, at the prior meetings we've had breakdowns uh, and charts showing these expenses and how they're broken down. Also, um, how much have we spent thus far on the drive-through testing? Mayor, uh, those costs will still be provided as part of Lupus presentation. What Odi is doing okay. is a reimbursement overview since there were some questions last meeting. So she's going to walk you through uh, what we're doing overall on the reimbursement side. Okay. Sorry okay. about that. Actually, actually, I'm um, sorry about that. Actually, to be uh, for th that information was is not going to be provided this time around. We're kind of, we're kind of focused on this reimbursement process. I, Noel, um, I have a question. Um, what's driving the overtime costs here, just in general? This includes a, a lot of the hazard pay was being tracked as overtime. That needs to be manually adjusted out. That, that wasn't separated. So in terms of uh, what I've asked Luca to do is making sure that how we're tracking hazard pay and overtime, that that is separated. That report is also being cleaned up as we speak. So it could be less. Correct, in terms of what's true overtime and what's actually hazard pay. Okay. We go to the next uh, slide, please. And uh, the purpose of this slide is just to give a, a, a basis of, of how we've handled the previous uh, incident. Uh, most recent one was the immigrant influx. Uh, activity on this uh, started April of 2019 and concluded December 2019. Uh, we, we have the same strategy. We, start, we set up the uh, department expenditures in anticipation of having some type of reimbursement process. Not until July 1st did we get notice uh, that there was funding going to be available through this. The funding got funded through the FEMA program, which was uh, later funneled through the um, Emergency Food and Shelter program. On this, on it, on this uh, Emergency Food and Shelter program, they have different uh, uh, allowance for reimbursable expenses on, on on this particular granting source total expenditures that we had a uh, documented was close to four hundred thousand. the first phase of the award was uh, that we had expenditures which in included the period of october uh, excuse me january through june 30th uh, request for reimbursement was opened up in september and it was funded uh, in the amount of one hundred ninety seven thousand dollars the second phase was opened up uh, because uh, the funding initially there was 25 million uh, allowed for this program. Funding was not depleted, so they opened a second phase for reimbursement. Uh, open, it was opened up in the month of March, and we're pending the uh, final uh, final amounts to be funded. The second part is about uh, almost 200 thousand. Uh, so that late May is when we'll identify how much of that funding is going to get reimbursed. And again, it's just contingent on the availability of the funds that we had. And um, we, we feel that there, there will be sufficient funds to cover this. Next slide, please. Uh, so, so Mayor and Commission, just to kind of reset the purpose of what we're doing this, this particular update, 
the approach is a little bit different. And on the first slide, there was an overview. What we're doing here is because of the questions we got last time, we're, we're doing this uh, update on the reimbursement side. We can send the drill down as we typically do on the Looper presentation. But what we did as a staff this past week is spend some time to show you all what we're doing today, how the most recent reimbursement experience went, and then where we are on funding that we've received and funding that we're pursuing. So that's where this particular update is centered a bit more on the reimbursement. Yes, good evening, Honorable Mayor, City Commissioners. This is Marina Solesi. Apologies, my camera's on, but it's not showing. I'll be covering the different funding sources in response to COVID-19, in addition to what Odie and Lupe had covered. This slide outlines different agencies that are providing COVID-19 opportunities. Some of the examples include the Department of Justice, which I'll go more into details, uh, the Department of Transportation with FAA, FTA, U.S. Housing and Urban Development, U.S. Department of Com Commerce with EDA. Next slide, please. On this slide, uh, we have received the following allocations or notification of allocations, and it's divided by the following agencies. We have um, U.S. Housing and Urban Development, with a total of $2,416,936 in allocation funding for, and that's broken down between two programs, the Community Development Block Grant, which we know as CDBG, for over 1.5 million, and the Emergency Solutions Grant, known as ESG, for over $800,000. The next uh, agency is the Department of Transportation with the funds for the airport relief funds in the amount of over $1.8 million, and this is to help supplement loss of revenues for that, as well as the Federal Transit Administration for transit over $7.5 million for operational costs to maintain services and loss of revenues. And, and then for te Texas Division of Emergency Management, and, re and we the letter was just sent out from the governor yesterday, it's dated yesterday regarding the announcement of the Coronavirus Relief Fund. So for the city of Brownsville, um, we are able to receive an immediate allocation once we're certified by the state of over $2 million and the remaining balance out of the $10,209,375 uh, will be on a reimbursement request basis. So that would be, the remaining would be up to eight, over $8.1 million. In addition to these allocations, there are other funding that has been secured, such as under fire with the Depart Department of Health Human Services of $108,907 in relief fund payments. This is through an auto stimulus payment as a Medicare billing service. And then um, other funds are being leveraged through the public health department. On this slide, this is the current applications that the uh, team is working on. The first one you see listed is the Coronavirus Emergency Supplemental Fund for a federal allocation of $110,433. We are um, working with the Office of Emergency Management, Finance, Fire and Police for this application for funding will be to cover first responder technology and the remaining for EPD salary. And we're hoping to submit this before the end of this month. The next one is the local council of governments, the Lower Rio Grande Valley Development Council for the coronavirus emergency supplemental funding allocation. This is due mid-June. And so we're working with the Office of Emergency Management, Finance, Fire, Police. This is not yet available until we submit the application for the first uh, funding that, that was mentioned here on this listing. The next one is the Assistance to Firefighter Grant. And this particular one is specific to the supplemental coronavirus funding. This we where um, we'll be submitting by the end of this week with the fire department, and funding from this grant will go towards the purchase of PPE. The last one listed here is actually a technical assistance grant that has been submitted, and this is to produce economic and demographic research that would help highlight in our community 
actually a countywide um, challenges that are specific to immigrant communities in response to emergency um, emergencies such as this as COVID. So we do have, um, we're anticipating to provide a positive announcement tomorrow regarding this opportunity. I'd like to also add that we're currently reviewing the NOFO in re that recently came out under the Department of Commerce for EDA for CARES funding. And so we're currently working with the plan planning department on that. And so with that, I'm going to um, transition to Ramiro, who's going to cover um, the efforts on the legislative side. Marina, before you go on, I, I do have a question. Um, the, uh, the grants that you mentioned, including the TDEM one and the uh, other ones on that first slide, uh, yes. is there a deadline? My understanding is for the, the TDEM one, uh, it's, toward, it's the end of the year, am I correct? And it, it's retroactive uh, as well. I don't see any qualifications or any uh, specifications on there. Yes, Mayor, you're correct. Um, the TDEM one, as far as that 80% for reimbursements, are for costs incurred between the periods of March 1st, 2020, through the end of December 30th, 2020. Okay. And these other, are the, is that going to be contingent? The reimbursements, uh, the 8167000 is that going to be contingent on availability of funding, like the one we just heard from Lupe on um, from the one that, um, the immigration one that we saw earlier? Is this TDEM one also going to be contingent on the availability of funds? This TDEM one, they, the way they present the information is that they show that for Brownsville, they, they have set aside a total of $10,209,375. So they've already showed that set aside out of their overall funding. And 20% of that uh, we can receive immediately upon uh, submittal of documentations and certification by the state. The, the, funding, the, funding, the funding is a funding. And other yeah. items we're spending on, on other items um, that weren't anticipated. So I just want to make sure that the spending that we're going through is is, the, is you're anticipating that that's going to be reimbursed to a certain extent. Otherwise, we need to make sure that we kind of match that spending. I think, Mayor, the uh, to answer your question, I think the funding, it, uh, at least the the Title Five funding, the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, the two million is a direct allocation. As soon as we we provide some paperwork, the eight million, uh, like like it's spelled out here, is it's on an eight point. It's eight point one million is available, but we need to submit. Uh, we need to charge against that basically. So we need to submit all our all our information, um, and and they'll be reviewing it before they release the money. But the two the two million, um, it, the way it seems to work is just you know, automatic as soon as we submit, you know, a certain amount of paperwork. But the funding is available. It's not one of these things that Congress still needs to approve. Congress already approved this. This was in the first CARE Act. And so um, that's what that's what's uh, that that's what we qualify for. Um, and I mean, it's a little bit a little bit tricky, but I think it but to answer your question is the funding is already available. It's there. We just need to submit for for it. Yeah, so you just need to, to show that the, the expenditures were necessary and were incurred with, due to the public health emergency <clears throat> with COVID. And the eligible expenses for that for that fund uh, are uh, as follows, directly from the website, medical expenses, public health expenses, uh, payroll expenses for public safety, public health, healthcare, human services, uh, expenses of actions to facilitate compliance with COVID-19, uh, expenses associated with the provision of economic support in connection with the COVID-19 public health emergency and any other COVID related expenses reasonably necessary to the function of government that satisfies the funds eligibility criteria. Yes, that's correct. That does not fund uh, lack of revenue. So um, that goes to the next. So. I just wanted to clear up a little bit about Texas A&M. We heard on, on the last meeting, um, I contacted the Vice Chancellor for Government Affairs 
Um, and so the, the, the confusion at the time was Texas A&M does house TDEM and they, they work out of Texas A&M. Uh, and then the other thing is through with this Title V funding, they've activated their AgriLife Extension uh, and uh, Engineering Extension Service to provide um, to provide any assistance uh, to communities that might need it um, so that we can maximize the amount of funding that communities get back. Um, I think this is more, you know, I think we might be able to use that, but I think this is more for, uh, if you know anything about the AgriLife Extension, it's really about rural communities uh, and trying to get them to tap into some of this funding. So that's that's a little bit about Texas A&M. And then on the, on the next slide, um, you know, uh, other initiatives that we follow, uh, obviously we're signing on to, to all the letters that come out. Uh, we get daily updates from the U.S. Conference of Mayors. Uh, TML sends out some updates. I have a call, we have a call with TML this week. Um, you know, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors just sent a, uh, a, a notice um, the, the, the House of Representatives has, uh, has submitted a bill for $187, million, $187 billion, um, and this, this bill uh, would uh, provide, it's called the HEROES Act. Um, this is emergency fiscal assistance, so this is um, more targeted to uh, funding gap, gaps in revenue. It, to cities, and so um, you know we'll we'll continue and closely follow that that bill to see where it ends up. Obviously, this is on the House side. Uh, there is some resistance um, to support cities on the Senate side, um, and uh, so we'll we'll continue to monitor and, and see what we can do. Um, and uh, obviously, we're we have to you know craft a new legislative agenda. Uh, for the upcoming session in January, um, and obviously we think COVID will be a big topic. Uh, and also, you know, this um, there's going to have to be we're going to have the cities will have to play a big defensive role uh, once again against the state wanting to uh, you know take control of everything uh, and leave the cities uh, and counties powerless. So there will that will continue this session. So with that, um, that is that is my report on that side. Uh, and, and Mayor and Commission members, just to add some some additional financial information, uh, in in a week's time from the last update that y'all received uh, last Tuesday, there wasn't anything substantive to change on the expenditure side. However, as you can see through the reimbursement information, there were more more notable changes on the reimbursement <coughs> side, particularly the TDM. That's a that's a huge chunk of funding. And how we intend to use it strategically is similar to how we're using the B Metro and the, the FAA and FTA. Is trying to basically find operating costs that we could uh, have qualify for reimbursement, so that we offset any potential revenue declines. For sales tax, we're down nine percent for the month of March, but year to date, we're still up three percent because we had a good first six months of the year. That's what the tracking tool will do next Tuesday. We're going to put this together with the total expenditures with the updated revenues in one single spreadsheet that ties it all together. But we wanted to give you the update and answer questions on the reimbursement side, highlight some of the significant sources of funding that we have received, and then tie that back to expenditures that we've incurred and where we're, what we're projecting between now and the end of the fiscal year. Um, how much have we spent on the drive through testing, Ben? Because that wasn't presented and it has been, and Luca said he wasn't going to present it specifically. So do you have that number? Does somebody have that number? Or do we have it as part of the next presentation for the drive through I, I do not, sir. Um, based on, based on last, uh, this is Lupe, based on last presentation, we spent about, uh, about 130,000, 80, 46,000 uh, medical costs associated with uh, medical personnel and about uh, 87,000 in testing kits for non insured. So the grand total, Lupe, I'm sorry, 120 something? One, 130, about 130, 130, 
Yes, sir, that's the last week. That's the number I remember as well. We can update the numbers from last week and send it out uh, tomorrow to give you that update as well. But yeah, I think it's important to get that. I don't know why it wasn't presented or why it's not being presented this time. It's been presented at every other meeting, so I, I do expect that to be presented. If we're going to be meeting uh, to get updates like this uh, outside of our regular scheduled meetings, and I think it's important to have that. And we can add, we can add, we can send, we'll send it out tomorrow because it wasn't shared during the meeting and make sure we add it also. The intent was to focus on the reimbursement, but we uh, didn't mean to not share any other information that is relative to financial updates. Honorable Mayor, Commissioners, good evening. I wanted to give an update of Public Health Department specifically on the COVID-19 drive through testing site. Our running totals as of May 11th, 2020, uh, thus far we've had 1,941 uh, tests administered. Uh, of those, uh, 1,960 did not meet criteria. Our running total for insured to uninsured is 53.5% uh, insured to 46.5 uninsured. Uh, we have reported 114 positive cases to Cameron County and 1,781 negative results thus far. As of today, we have uh, 49 results pending. Specifically for this, uh, for yesterday, we have, uh, we're at day 34 as of yesterday for the COVID drive through Yesterday, we did have 39 uh, individuals present, uh, 15 insured, 24 uninsured. Uh, and uh, for Harlingen, Yesterday, we had two patients come through, two insured, zero uninsured. Uh, we have not reported any positives through the COVID-19 drive through for Harlingen and seven negative. Uh, thus far to date, we've had 21 individuals tested representing Harlingen, and we've got 14 samples pending for Harlingen, and this would be day six for Harlingen uh, drive through totals. Next, um, next slide. I also want to add, we continue uh, using a uh, the swab only, uh, and we have not uh, gone back to sputum since we converted. Uh, Ms. Jones will now present on the, our cumulative case and estimated recoveries. And for, new to this, we're also going to be adding our case fatality rate since we uh, at the next slide since we did have a uh, one death reported in Branson. Dr. Rodriguez, really briefly before you go on, um, have we we've been doing the swabs only for? approximately about two weeks or more. Have we seen a higher positive rate since we went to swabs only? Overall percentage of, of positives that come back? Oh, um, um, we, we actually do have that. We, I've got the positivity rate and since we've begun, it has, we have seen say. an increase. We, we have seen uh, a, a slight increase uh, of about one and a half percent, is it? We're, we're looking at a graph on another computer. Uh, we, we have seen a slight increase. I, I won't give you the number uh, just because the graph is small, but we have seen a slight increase in the positivity rate. Okay, I, I kind of anticipated that because before I think we were at less than 10%. And now that we've gone to swaps, I think it's gone over 10% based on the amount of people that are getting tested. But I could be wrong. I'm just doing basic math based on the numbers you present. Yeah, no, we're still running at, at a grand total of 6.22% uh, positivity rate. but but converting from a sputum to a swab did, did improve that number, 1.5%. Can, uh, can you just send me, when you have a chance, the, uh, the, the percentage of positives since we've gone to uh, swab only, please? Absolutely, sir. I'm pretty sure it's more than 1.5% based on what I've seen. Yeah, we'll, we'll share it with you. And we'll be. Uh, and I want, to give Dr. Gowan, I want to give Dr. Gowan credit for that because she did push for the swaps based on the accuracy and the amount of, uh, of tests we've performed since, I think, shows that the accuracy is a lot better on swaps. So I think we're getting more positives because of the accuracy and reliability of those tests. So thank you, Dr. Gowan. Um, absolutely. But also keep in mind that as we go forward, we're loosening the restriction, the criteria to do testing. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so that's a that's a good thing. Means we're going to pick up more positives. It also means that in the beginning, when we were more restrictive, we may have missed some. So, you know, that's 
that's going to influence the percentage as well as we move forward. Correct. The, the, the takeaway point is that our positives are our true or positive and our negative is a true or negative just by the method that we switched over. We may show more negatives, but that's just the, the population that we're getting that's being tested. And it's a larger proportion of that number. All right, um, and then on this particular slide, I did get back with um, Could I uh, my contacts. Is there a difference in the cost for the two different tests? No, sir. The same? Okay. Because some people uh, are going through their insurance. Are some people paying out of their pocket? Uh, no, sir. The, con the contract we have with a vendor uh, does not add uh, the copay amount. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, and so um, as I uh, mentioned last week, I did get back with the DSHS to see if they were altering any of the estimated recoveries and the cumulative cases. So this is the updated version um, of, of those numbers. Um, so you're, you saw just a little slight drop in some of the estimated recovery, but it wasn't uh, uh, very noticeable. It was just a couple of uh, individuals. So, um, and that's with the updated version. Um, I think they got back to me last Thursday. So I updated all the numbers with the new formulas. And then can we go to the next uh, slide? And this right here is our daily case counts that we're receiving um, beginning March 21st. And now that we have had our first COVID um, death, I'm gonna um, begin adding those to the charts also so that we can kind of see how those are progressing and what uh, what's going on within the community as it pertains to those to see if uh, we need to make uh, additional mitigation or change some of the strategies or or what have you um, with some of the guidelines and guidances that are coming out from the CDC and from the uh, Department of State Health Services. And then the next slide. And this is still the same, um, whether we're seeing them through community link to previous case or travel, and we're still overwhelmingly out of all of our cases, still seeing a link to previous cases, which is really what we wanna do because that allows us to make sure that we are able to contain um, any outbreaks, if we're seeing it within like family clusters or apartment clusters or or something of that nature, um, we'll get a little more concerned if the community spread starts increasing. And I just want to uh, let you know that since we've started the reopening process, we're monitoring a lot of these numbers a little more closely um, along with um, our case increases. So um, it's still early, um, but we're still seeing uh, predominantly linked to previous cases, which is where we want to be right now. And then the next slide. And then this is just a an update on our numbers as to what age groups are being affected in Brownsville uh, by cases categorized by their age groups. And and I think the story here is uh, fortunate we're seeing that it's occurring a lot in our both our uh, 20, 30 year olds, uh, and and these people are are not necessarily requiring hospitalization but tertiary care such as a prescription, fever control methods and so forth, which is where you want to be on the side on the side of this pandemic, this is where you want to be, where you're having resolution of the of the flu like symptoms very similar to to if you were dealing with flu cases. Next slide. So the next uh, part of this presentation is our COVID-19 boots on the ground operations. We're at day 19. We continue citywide operations. We're finishing up um, uh, South Coast. Uh, tomorrow we'll be moving to a different section. Uh, but thus far, we had 18 door-to-door -door events. Over, um, we've had over eight, 800 uh, distributed today alone, uh, and we did the two food banks last uh, last two weeks, and we've reached over 24% of households, which is represents 12,340 households thus far and we continue with the same number of staff uh, participating and we continue to add material today i'm happy to report we had local businesses donate reusable bags um i'm probably going to miss a name but i'm going to say a few of the ones that came through autry's pharmacy uh walmart and uh and we we had a, a third vendor uh donate some reusable bags as well but I think this is key because the community is coming together and donating uh, these supplies. Uh, Brownsville PUB was actually that 
our third uh, individual who donated reusable bags. In addition, we had a pallet of PPE equipment donated this afternoon by Walmart. And right now we're working with Walmart to distribute that, uh, not only in the community, but to distribute to the nursing homes. And, and we're working on a strategy uh, for that. Next slide. We want to thank you for your support and dedication. Any questions? Dr. Rodriguez, are you able to uh, quantify or have you been able to determine how many of those individuals that are getting the bags are actually participating in the drive through testing or using any of the other services? So one of the things that we're doing is we're doing call, callbacks to addresses and we're, we're looking at our symptoms by address uh, and then we're coming back and looking at the areas that, that, we're, that we've been addressing. It, it's a moving target for us because some people will represent an address uh, for purposes of insurance, but potentially the address may not pop up where we see some of the activity. So it's a moving target for us. But to answer your question in, in a very direct manner, uh, the boots on the ground has yielded more people calling our offices asking for information. And I know we had discussed doing a robocall for symptoms. Do you have any updates on that? Yes, sir. I'm happy to report that uh, Felipe Romero, our communications director, was able to get a BISD to use their database to do robocalls. And this process began uh, on Friday of last week. So if you have not gotten a robocall yet through BISD, uh, you will be getting a robocall soon. One of the things, Dr. Art, that the mayor and I learned when we had our medical mm -hmm. talk with some of the local doctors is that this um, pandemic, the restrictions that we've had to impose are really affecting children that are within our community. And so my concern, one, I'm hearing that there are children within our community that have gotten the virus. Okay. And I'm hearing that there are children that have gotten very, very sick from COVID and even needed hospitalization in our community um, but is there anything else that the city can be doing to kind of you know just let parents uh, educate help help educate parents and let them know you know new parenting advice and and, and things you know i can speak as a parent it's so hard to raise kids who you know they don't always mm -hmm. understand what's going on would hope that the city would have a greater role in helping um, raise these kids. But I, let me, I'm happy to report that from the Zika event that we had in 2016, one of the uh, occurrences is we were able to get funded for a resiliency grant. And that grant was uh, what put our, our epidemiologist in place through a maternal and child grant. So to your answer your question, we actually are in a better position today because of the Zika efforts to to be able to do outreach with pediatrics. And I'm actually gonna uh, ask Ms. Jones to kind of answer that question because we have already done some activity and continue to work through that. Um, hello again. So um, one of the things that we were charged with with the community, um, the Title V Healthy Texas Mothers and Babies uh, grant was to uh, build that community coalition. Um, and so one of the things that I have done is I send out uh, updates to that community coalition and ask them to disseminate that information. Also, I'm part of the community partners calls at the 1130, which um, are now on Monday, Wednesday, Fridays. And so when new information comes about, especially with uh, some of the new presentations with uh, the Kawasaki and the toxic uh, shock syndrome, um, that it appears that might be affecting the younger children, we did put that out. Um, and I do know that um, I'm also part of the maternal child um, health epidemiologist subcommittee group on the CSTE. And so they're trying to develop a case definition uh, for some of the um, uh, childhood illnesses associated with the COVID-19. And once those case definitions come um, and become finalized, um, we do expect that the CDC will look those over. And once that happens, DSHS will also get on board with that. And then we can start um, pushing it out in that particular manner. I'm also in the middle of acquiring uh, practicum individuals from Texas A&M right now, and they are going to be solely dedicated to the maternal and child health aspect because part of um, 
since this is broken out is I haven't been able to devote as much time to the maternal and child health aspect of it. And so I, um, I reached out and was like, we, I need some extra help on this particular aspect. And so um, we should finish up. We've gotten uh, several um, resumes from some of the students and that should begin. I think their work plans are due the 20th and then we should be able to start them developing um, not only COVID related, but also nutrition, um, parenting skills. And we're also in, and I should get approval from DSHS at the end of this week or the beginning of next week, um, where we have altered what we were originally gonna do because we were gonna do a community health worker and a dietitian. We're gonna swap that over to an LVN. And we once DSHS approves that, which I have been told verbally that it shouldn't be a problem, then we'll also have that um, nurse on hand so that way they can also help out um, with the COVID aspect, but also with the parenting aspect with our families. It's just everything right now is probably a week or two away from being uh, finalized and, and getting going full, full speed. I'm glad to hear that because when we hosted our medical talk, that was the number one question coming in mm -hmm. about kids and Kawasaki disease and all of these things. Mm -hmm. And we're so grateful we had Dr. Zamir who gave us so much information and about continuing to, you know, six, six, six o'clock, 630 in the morning, get your kids up, get them showered, get them dressed, brush their teeth. And the most important thing is to have some sort of routine so these kids fall into the rhythm of that and not feel lost and lonely. Mm -hmm. And it was so scary to hear that children within Brownsville had had these, you know, issues with, you know, suicidal thoughts and things like that, because this is such a uh, shock to everybody to be, you know, in your home and in your room for so long. It's something that I'm really glad that we can have an open discussion with and maybe help some parents out there. And, and I want to close by saying, so there's a good translation of how we take this and, and apply it. So the, as this material is available to us, we're actually going to insert this into our packages that we're doing out in the neighborhoods. So as the information is changing or being updated, we're flexible enough where we can change some of the material that's in the kit and update so to provide the latest information that's available. Thank you. Thank you. If I may add, um, I, this is Nurith, by the way. I would like to publicly thank the public health department for uh, the past two, three weeks concentrating on district one to disseminate all this information which, which i think is very valuable to the citizens i especially appreciate you allowing me to uh, accompany you on, on these efforts um we've we've covered so much ground in district one that um i'm really appreciative and i actually think that having the one with the personal contact with the people has been uh, helpful the robocalls might might work too, but um, I'm glad that we did this first round trying to actually have the, a face-to-face -face contact with people. Also, we uh, covering the uh, or being present at the food giveaways at the South Most Library and at the Brownsville Event Center, I think was very helpful because you would once again get an opportunity to talk to people individually and if, answer any questions that they might have. And today was a special day because we were accompanied by three promotoras. In the future, I think it would or, or I would appreciate the opportunity to joint efforts with uh, have the public health department join with uh, promotoras because they have a different touch. They do more work uh, on the ground on a regular basis like the public health department does, but they also have their own networks that they uh, reach out to. And so if we could maybe in the future, especially in important situations like this, if we can work with the promotoras hand in hand, I think it'll be even more effective. So um, thank you very much, the public health department. Um, I'm really impressed with the work that y'all have done. Thank you. I will always compliment the public health department as well and uh, remember as well that the, the public health department has been working with the Promotora team and outreach team of the School of Public Health for many years and they do a really good job and they're used to that relationship and our people benefit from it. On a different note, Art, I forgot to ask back when we were talking about testing, I noticed that the county was going to start mobile um, testing. Mm -hmm. And are we aware, have, have we had any contact with them to, to just kind of compare our criteria for testing with theirs and make sure it's in line? Uh, no, they, they have communicating the testing sites and the fact that their campaign is going to be on, on weekends, but we have not reached out to them to see what their criteria for being tested is, but I certainly can reach out to them and, and see what is their intentions. 
Yeah, I mean, not in a negative way, but just to see, are they, um, are they in line? Are we in line with them? Um, we, we would want anybody that, that calls or, or logs in for testing to qualify for either site and not be excluded from one site or another. Yeah, absolutely, I will. That's a very good thought. Thank you. Mayor, commissioners, this concludes our report. Thank you for your, for your thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Fantastic. Next, we have uh, item number two, presentation and possible action on letter of support for grant submittal by the South Texas Astronomical Society, known as STARS, for the creation of Planetary Human Science Museum. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm Victor De Los Santos. Uh, thank you guys for hosting us. Uh, with me here is uh, Maria Jate. She is uh, also part of the South Texas Astronomical Society with me. Um, just before we start really quick, I do want to clear up there was uh, the for this action item, uh, we are going to mention a planetarium and science museum, but um, the, the, t the main topic for this presentation is going to be more leaning towards a program that we are working with, uh, with UTRGV. Uh, so would you mind if I share my screen to show the presentation? I don't have an issue with that so long as the tech department's uh, made sure that it's, it's okay for you to share and that we have sound when you do share. Okay, I did not send this through the tech department. You're available to share your screen. Oh, okay. Share your screen. Just click on your name, Victor. I got it. You guys see my screen? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> All right, cool. Well, we'll go ahead and start. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Amiro and the city commissioners and uh, everybody on this call for inviting us to the uh, today's special meeting. Uh, the topic of this presentation is going to be possible support from the city of Brownsville for an NSF grant partnership that we are working on with UTRGV. Uh, we are going to present as the South Texas Astronomical Society or STARS and uh, we are also presenting on behalf of UTRGV. We are working with Dr. Mario Diaz from the university. He was not able to, to be on this call, but we are representing on his behalf. So here's the agenda. We're going to try to make this uh, as quick as possible. Uh, first, we're going to give a, a just a quick introduction for STARS. Uh, and who we are, for those who have not heard of us, I know a couple people on the call have, some might have not. Uh, then we'll go ahead and get into the grant, uh, just talk about some outcomes, and we'll leave the floor open for any questions if there are any. So the South Texas Astronomical Society is a Brownsville community-based nonprofit focusing on space science research, education, and outreach. We've been working on things since the beginning of last year, so we created this little uh, comprehensive timeline just to sum everything up. So we started uh, towards the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. I met with Dr. Mario Diaz of UTRGV, uh, and he introduced me to Carol Lutzinger, who is a BISD science curriculum specialist. Um, with about a week and a half notice, we hosted uh, an event for the Super Blood Wolf Moon at Pulham Elementary, where my mom is the, uh, the principal. And it, it went really great. Uh, over 400 students and parents showed up with very short notice on a Sunday night, on a school night at 10 p.m. And uh, not too long after that, uh, Maria Jete, who's on this call, uh, also jo joined and she helped us rebrand everything completely. So in July of last year, we hosted our first official inaugural event at the Resaca de la Palma State Park in North Brownsville. And we did that in collaboration with the Cristina Torres Memorial Observatory, where we celebrated the Apollo moon landing 50 year anniversary. Fast forward to February of this year, and we, we held two events at the first annual Crossroads Festival. We worked uh, really closely with Ramiro, who was great and helped us make our two events, the, a, a Space City panel and networking mixer, um, a really great success. 
and we also worked with BCIC and uh, SpaceX. Um, so between that time frame, between July and, and February, we held um, over 20 events with uh, our partner organizations that we've worked with in the in the uh, in the community, and and we'll talk more about why that's relevant a little bit later on. And um, also, uh, you guys, and some of you might have heard through Nudif, but uh, it wasn't until late March where we finally received a nonprofit status. And the only reason that that, that was uh, that we wanted to emphasize that is to to highlight the fact that we up until now or we had done all these events, uh, 20 plus events, with no outside funding. We did it all with uh, the support of our community partners. And these are all the ones that we've uh, worked with. We work with the schools at UTRGV and TSE. We've hosted stargazing events at the State Park and National Wildlife Refuge, Laguna Cascosa. We've had workshops and seminars at the libraries. Uh, we had public meetups at coffee shops. And we had, for the older crowd, we had stars on tap at Las Ramblas. So for all, for all of these, we've worked uh, for either resources, content, or just a, a venue. And so right now, this is uh, our board. We have uh, seven board members with all different kinds of uh, expertise and uh, two people on our advisory board. One of those uh, people on our advisory board is Dr. Diaz, who, um, for the sake of the grant, I'll introduce him. Uh, Dr. Diaz is a professor of physics and astronomy at UTRGV. He is the director for the Center of Gravitational Wave Astronomy and the Cristina Torres Memorial Observatory there at Rusaka de la Palma. Um, we do, he, he doesn't usually like to brag, so he didn't really like this, but we, we thought that for the sake of, because of the, the, the kind of the size of this grant, um, we want to, we wanted to give a little, we wanted to note the credible awards that he's gotten. So he, um, he's gotten two very big awards um, for his work on gravitational wave astronomy at UTRGV. Uh, this year, he received the Leopoldo Garcia Collin Medal Award for the discovery of gravitational waves and the support of Latin American scientists in that discipline. And uh, he has also secured more than $30 million in funding total from National Science Foundation, uh, NASA, the Air Force and private foundations. So now I'll talk a little bit about the, the grant that we would like to apply for. This grant um, is under NSF's program called uh, the Improving Undergraduate STEM Education Hispanic Serving Institutions Program. The mission for this program under NSF is to enhance the quality of undergraduate STEM education at Hispanic serving institutions and to increase retention and graduation rates of undergraduate students pursuing degrees in science, technology, engineering, and math at Hispanic serving institutions. The specific um, part, the specific area that we would want to write our grant for is a priority area two, and it's called uh, innovative cross-sector partnerships. The goal being to develop cross-sector partnerships that lead to increased student engagement uh, in STEM research and learning experiences while also generating knowledge about how cross-sector partnerships contribute to STEM teaching and learning and workforce development. So with uh, Dr. Diaz's credentials and, and his awards and his all the research and experiments happening at UTRGV and the, our, our uh, experience working with Dr. Diaz and his groups and, and the community, we thought that working together on this, it, it really, we, we thought that we could do something great here. Um, the grant is for, it's a recurring grant uh, for up to $2.5 million over five years. Uh, so that's about $500,000 a year. Um, we don't have the, the uh, exact program or budget yet. Uh, Dr. Diaz is, is working on that with his team at, at the university. Uh, I know their goal is to, to use about three to $400,000 per year, not 500,000. So this is the, uh, the logo for that uh, Improving Undergraduate STEM Education program. So stakeholders. Uh, so for right now, we have um, a, a basic overview summary of what this 
program would be. Uh, Dr. Diaz called it BASE, the Brownsville Alliance for Science Education. The participating institutions right now would be UTRGV's Department of Physics and Astronomy, the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy, the CTM Observatory, which are all under Dr. Diaz, uh, Texas Southmost College, the, independent, the Brownsville Independent School District, Resaca de la Palma State Park, uh, us at STARS, and hopefully the city of Brownsville. So our summary is that we want to, um, propose, we want to propose to create a partnership to support long-term transformation in science education in Brownsville and the RGV through this community-based effort. Uh, the core of the effort would be at the observatory at Resaca de la Palma State Park, uh, but we also want to talk a little bit about the, the creation of a space science museum and planetarium for Brownsville. Um, so the partnership would concentrate its efforts on training science teachers and instructors from BISD, TSC, uh, ETRGV, and developing materials for those uh, institutions. The goals for BASE would be to engage high school TSC and general education UTRGV students in hands-on inquiry-based astronomy and physics education, and to train high school teachers, uh, TSE and UTRGV instructors in the utilization of that teaching, teaching methodology. So basically being very hands-on uh, with the observatory. The, the end goal would be to have these instructors be able to, to, lead, uh, to lead instruction sessions at the observatory. So here's a little bit about that, uh, that CTMO complex. It's a state-of-the-art facility. Right now, there are 10 domes, one big one and nine smaller ones uh, with digital cameras. The end goal would be is to make all these completely robotic so that they are operated through the internet. Uh, at the CTMO happening right now, um, already for the past few years, students have been able to track asteroids, um, observe variable stars, observe exoplanets, and study astronomical transients. The facility is also open to the public. Uh, it would provide opportunities for informal astronomy education, uh, promote the state park itself, and be a true environmental jewel for the community. Uh, so for high school teacher training, um, Dr. Diaz and his groups have actually had high school physics and astronomy training for teachers from BISD and San Benito ISD at the, at the facility in the past. Uh, the next step in, in the goal is to be able to have everything be robotic so that the teaching and instruction can happen from a classroom, from a computer. You can, um, you can control these domes and the telescopes remotely. So when I first met Dr. Diaz back in, in December 2018, uh, Right away, he we started talking about this vision to, to I, I went to him because I wanted to help with outreach and, and he said, yeah, that's great. Let's start. And we had this vision for a future space science institute, which included a planetarium and also includes uh, exhibits around uh, physical science principles, uh, NASA missions, LIGO and the discovery of gravitational waves um, and just Proof that show that Brownsville has a part in, in the history of, of these different organizations and, and sciences. Um, and so looking ahead, we the, the, the starting facilitation for this program would be uh, at, the, at the state park and, and where the observatory is at and possibly even at UTRGV. Uh, but for the future, we would like to have um, a space science institute and planetarium uh, in the downtown Midi Cultural District area to be uh, a museum style showcase for local space science development that would also tie it into the uh, to the mainstream science that you usually see at, at museums and also be a, a training facility that would be a home for this program that we that we mentioned uh, because the program is we're expecting it to grow and, and eventually require its own home. So what we're asking for um, right now uh, the, is the city of Brownsville's support and endorsement uh, in, a, in a letter of support. And the reason that that, that is due this week is because UTRGV uh, can only submit one 
there can only be one submission for the grants per institution. So UTRGV created their own deadline, and that is uh, by, by this week for, for a, just a, a short two-page proposal. Um, and we would love to be able to add the city of Brownsville's support for that. Um, September is when the grant application for NSF is, is actually due. And so for September, what we would like is to continue the discussion and, and hopefully have a dedicated space for the program, a, a, a home for a planetarium and science institute museum that we would help bring here and, and work with uh, local scientists and the community to put together. Um, preferably in the in the midi cultural district uh, brownsville downtown area and to just have all the to formalize and strengthen the partnerships that are going to be essential to the program so the outcome for all this um, outcomes for brownsville is we believe that this aligns with the long-term educational and cross-institutional goals we would like to provide the community access to higher education through the university uh, we empower educators by bringing additional STEM resources and opportunities into the classroom and beyond that. Uh, broaden the economic, uh, local, the local economic outlook for Brownsville because more STEM education means better jobs and, and that means money back into the community. <laughs> and uh, like we said it, in Crossroads this year, we want to promote Brownsville as the, the space city that it's slowly becoming. Um, and, and promoted as a hub for science and space tourism. And that is the end of the presentation. Are there any questions? Victor, I have a question. Um, I think it's wonderful and you definitely have my support. Um, with respect to the planetarium or the museum that you talk about in MIDI, do you mean that you are looking for a dedicated piece of land? in the district or are you actually looking for a building for the museum we would we would uh, we would like a building for right now though um we uh it just a la land would work we actually have been having uh discussions recently and and things have been in some aspects things have been moving faster than others and uh, it's actually we, we've found that it's very possible to get uh, a, a planetarium down here so a planetarium would just require a land and we could even begin instruction in the planetarium and begin operations on that planetarium um, and throwing shows there uh, before the science museum even before we even have a, a building for the science museum the, the end goal of course we, we would like to have a science museum with that planetarium but for right now uh, either would work but oh. the letter for the grant, uh, the grant itself does not cover the, the cost of building a planetarium. Am I right? No, no, we, we are not saying no, no. The grant is just I'm uh, sorry. This, the letter of support would just be for um, for the, the grant and, and that the city of Brownsville would be uh, a partner and that we will continue discussion on on looking for a home for the program. OK, thank you. So, Victor, just to just to clarify, though, um, you're only asking us for the letter of support at this point, because I correct. Okay, because I don't have an issue with that. But if you're asking for land or building, then then that's going to be a different conversation, right? Because yeah, of course. Yeah, we we want it. That's going to cost yeah, we, we, that's some sort of money. So I'm not prepared to agree to that at this point. But uh, letter of support, I don't see an issue with that whatsoever. And I would have to agree with the mayor. I think this is a wonderful idea. I also agree with Dr. Gowan. This is a project that, as some people might remember, we worked up with the other commission on. These were really ideas that we wanted to get off the ground because we felt that with the arrival of SpaceX that we had to do something for the community to help, you know, just show people what exists in our backyard and how amazing um, SpaceX, all of the things that they're doing are. And on that note, to remind everybody that we are only a space city day by day because SpaceX is in our backyard. And have you reached out to them? Do they have any involvement or any input in these ideas? 
we worked with them briefly for for the crossroads um, for the crossroads panel they had at that starship presentation uh, before we talked and then at the networking mixer they uh, they supplied uh, merchandise for us to give out um, we haven't talked to them directly about this our stance though at uh, at the space city events that we held at crossroads our stance was that we do think that Brownsville has the potential to be a space city uh, and not not even just because of SpaceX, but because of there is a university full of astrophysicists and we have uh, an observatory and the research that they do is really great. And so since the, the start of this organization, our, our goal has been even before SpaceX to show the community what they have to offer. And so we think that, yes, yeah, SpaceX is doing a great job to to have the whole world looking at Brownsville for space, but we think that in order to get to get to reach our goal of having our community be a part of that, we need to in in not not just show off that we have SpaceX, but engrave the the astrophysics and space science research already going on at the university and and show and and start that interest from the K through 12 level so that they could grow into, so that the, our community can grow into the programs that the university has to offer and then eventually be a part of SpaceX and, and all the other um, space tech companies that might be living here in, in 10, 20 years. So sure. may I just say a few words? Uh, I just wanted to say that it's really a no-brainer. Of course, we, we would uh, want to reach out to them. It's, uh, but we have to have something to go there with. Uh, and also, we need time to develop relationships here and to do things right now with the community so that we can integrate all of this and bring it all together. And for us to be a space city, I think it's a no-brainer that we need to have a home for such uh, you know, institutional research and also development of everything that's happening. It needs there needs to be a hub for that, and if we can find a home, that, that's a long-term goal. But the first priority is to educate, enlighten, and just uh, inform people and involve them with what's happening in the community right now. There's some amazing things happening on in men, on many levels, both research and practical levels. Yeah, we definitely are. The end goal would be to to work with SpaceX. That would be great. But but I I think that we've we've seen that they don't respond very well to to ideas. And so we really want to provide them concrete evidence that Brownsville has the potential to be a part of that that space community on our own, so that they can help with that and not build it alone. I like that, Victor. Uh, so what is the total amount of the grant? The total amount of the grant is uh, up to 2.5 million over five years. Uh, so that's about 500,000 per year. But uh, from what I've, I, Dr. Diaz is still putting together the, the, the final budget for that. And I, 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 the last I heard him say was that he was going to try to make the program about 300,000 per year. And, and are you anticipating uh, constructing that little, um, the observatory cluster there out of that grant. No, that is that is purely Dr. Diaz. He actually that is already constructed. If you if you go over to Resaca de la Palma right there, you will see uh, one big dome and nine small domes around it that are already up. And he has been getting his own grants, um, I think, from NASA and the NSF to get the the, the that work done there. That's the, the only thing this grant would be for is for the program to yeah. train okay. high school teachers. I, I didn't realize it was that big. That's great. So Yeah, um, that it's relatively new. That's so. nice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And good luck with this. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would just have to say that going back to what we said, that SpaceX doesn't I mean you said that SpaceX doesn't respond well to ideas and I would just have to say that in my experience that's not true because I'm the city commissioner, the girl that traveled coast to coast, begging them to come here. <laughs> and eventually they did. So I just want to say that they're a wonderful company. They're wonderful to work with. We are so lucky to have them in our backyard. They've yeah. done so much. 
they have contributed to our museums, to our schools, to our STEM programs, to our universities. So I think he was trying to reach aspirations to approach them is, is what his point was. I don't think he's derogating them in any way. Oh, so, yeah, definitely not. So, no. Um, I'm going to go ahead and make a motion to approve this. Uh, uh, what are we doing? Uh, support, the support. I'll second that. A motion and a second to uh, sign on to the letter of support. Is there any further discussion? Those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. And Commissioner Golaski, did you vote on this? I did. Uh huh. Okay. Because you're a board member, I just didn't know if there was any sort of issue with that. I asked actually the city attorney and he informed me that there's no conflict because there are other situations where a, where a city commissioner will be on the board of an organization. Okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure just for your, just for you. Okay. Yes, sir. And just, and just for the record, we did give that advice. And uh, also if issues come up where there may be a conflict that as to specific items, you can always recuse at that. Sure, okay. Thank you, council. Motion passes. Thank you, guys. Very much. I'll move to adjourn. Second. We have a motion to adjourn and a second. Uh, those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? All right, we stand adjourned. Thank you.